It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode six, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Today, we have Linda Halley of Gardens of Egan in Northfield, Minnesota. Gardens of Egan is a large organic vegetable farm with a long history as a pivotal player in the Twin Cities local food scene. In addition to 30 plus acres of organic vegetables, Gardens of Egan produces organic transplants for growers and sales to stores. We'll spend some time talking about that subject before digging into Linda's strategies for employee management. One of the things that has struck me again and again at Gardens of Egan is how Linda really leverages her employees into high responsibility positions and retains them year after year. By the way, it was while driving to a party last August to celebrate the completion of Gardens of Egan's transition to certified organic that the idea for the Farmer to Farmer podcast really gelled. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Purple Pitchfork, providing tools and resources to farmers and food businesses to help them succeed in business, farming, and life. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also sponsored by Second Cup Media, helping tiny businesses build old-fashioned relationships using new fashion technologies. You can find the Farmer to Farmer podcast on Stitcher and on iTunes, where your ratings and reviews are a critical part of moving the show up in the lists and the search results, which helps get the Farmer to Farmer podcast out to more people. Thank you so much for joining me today. And now on to the show. Hello, Linda. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> so everybody out there in the in the listening land, I'm really thrilled to introduce my guest today, Linda Halley. Um, Linda, I've given our listeners just a little bit of an overview, but we'd like to hear more from you in your words about how you about Gardens of Egan and about how you got to be there. <laughs> okay. Well, um, right now I have a unique position. I'm a farm manager um, for a farm that's owned by the Wedge Food Co-op, which is a very large and very well-established 40-year-old food co-op that's in the Twin Cities, which is about 40 miles away from the farm. Um, I feel like we're blazing a trail here. There really aren't any other models doing this right now, at least in the Midwest. So... um, It's just, it feels really unique and it feels like we're making it up as we go along and trying to be a model of something that um, really does work. So I manage a hundred acre vegetable farm with 12 bays um, attached as an attached greenhouse to a potting shed. And we manage those, some as greenhouse bays and some has more like attached high tunnels. Those are pretty big pretty big bays, aren't they? Yeah. I guess I, if I was building them myself, I wouldn't build them quite as big. Um, they're 30 by almost 200. So um, yeah, each oh. bay is fairly large and we have 12 of them. And so you guys are doing the, the vegetables on the farm and then you also are doing the transplants on the farm, right? Yes. Um, I guess that We were looking for a farm that had some greenhouse facility. And when we found one with that large a facility, we thought, well, what can we do with all of that space? And we were already growing um, a small amount of transplants to sell to garden centers um, in the spring and at our farmer's market. So we kind of just looked at a business model that would better utilize a larger greenhouse facility. So now, besides the starter plants in the spring, which have expanded, um, we also grow transplants for other farmers and many, many transplants for ourselves because all of our crops except um, those planted in the high tunnels and uh, sweet corn are all transplanted crops. So we have, you know, I don't know, 5,000 trays of plants that we put out every year. 5,000, that doesn't seem like enough, but I did just do the math today. Um, So yeah, about 5,000 trays that we um, transplant. Just for yourselves. And then how much business are you doing with other farmers in that? Um, About equivalent. So half of the space in the greenhouse for um, farm transplants is ours and the other half we grow for other farmers. Okay. Well, that's not really true, Chris. We grow for other farmers and our starter plants. So the other half of the transplants we grow, um, they don't all go to farmers. Some of them do go to those garden centers still. In fact, that's a really important part of our business. Okay. And, and, And all of the plants that you're doing are certified organic, right? Yes. We feel like that's a really important, um, marketing 
niche for us. Um, as certified organic growers, we always felt like we were obligated to grow our own plants because where are you going to find certified organic transplants? And um, for the first five years that um, I managed Gardens of Egan, our greenhouse space was woefully inadequate. Um, part of our transplants came from um, an infield bed system which, you know, it's an old fashioned way to grow transplants and then you move them out into a field situation, but they're exposed to the weather and the vagaries of everything, including your cedar. And it just isn't a very secure way to grow transplants for your field. So we would have gladly bought organic transplants if we had had access to them, but we did not. Well, and so especially we know- on the scale that you guys were operating on. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we know that there must certainly be farmers out there who are looking for organic transplants. And then we also know there are farmers out there that they're not looking for them, but if they know they're available and they start to think about it, they might find that it's actually a a really practical way to bring in some or most of the transplants that they're going to put on their farm. I would think it'd be especially useful in a situation like dealing with early season crops where you've got to open your greenhouse two weeks early just to get the onions started, for example. Oh, great, Chris. That's the market you want us to have? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I'm not trying to push you into anything, Linda. But No, it is true. That's the obvious thing. And that is the first thing farmers have looked to us for is those really early crops that take longer in the greenhouse because then they don't have to open their greenhouse up quite as early or they don't have to hire people on quite as early. Um, And it just kind of makes sense to start with those early season crops. And some farms like the fact that we'll grow the late transplants for them. So once they get really busy out in the field, maybe they're just not as good at keeping their greenhouse, you know, a tight ship. So their summer transplants get a little neglected. And this is a way to get some good transplants in that have been, you know, really the focus of what we do. We have um, a greenhouse manager and a dedicated greenhouse crew that really pays attention to uh, plants growing in there from, you know, middle of February all the way through July and into August. So when, when you're, when somebody's buying plants from you now, you're, you're in Northfield, Minnesota, which is 45 minutes south of the Twin Cities. Yeah, that's pretty close. Okay. And now, I mean, this is the Midwest. I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of organic market gardeners around, but we're not all packed very closely together. So Mm -hmm. how are you getting those plants to people? Well, a couple different ways. We can use pallet freight. Um, We designed boxes that actually... um, protect our plants, our, the flats of our plants, and we can stack three flats inside each carton. And, um, you know, we just kind of had to design our own boxes, work with a box company here, but we can um, ship 54 flats on a pallet and uh, pallet freight can go almost anywhere. Um, we like to work with co-op partners because they're a partner of ours in that we're owned by the wedge and they are part of the wedge. And, and co-op partners is a, is a wholesale distributor mm-hmm. of produce and they work all over the upper Midwest, right? They do. Then they go to the very cities where most of the farms are marketing or are close by to those cities from anywhere from Chicago, Iowa City, Minneapolis, um, North Dakota, um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Wisconsin. So they're kind of all over the upper Midwest. So they are a really great conduit for pallet freight. And then there's this really great little service called Speedy, and they will take boxes much more cheaply than uh, UPS or FedEx, and they actually don't tip them upside down. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So we can send small amounts um, in cartons, and then we deliver to any anywhere in the metro area. And a lot of farmers, you'd be surprised, a lot of farmers um, prefer to pick their own plants up. And so they come and so many farmers use those black uh, bulb trays um, for harvest or to take things to market. Well, the flats fit perfectly in a black bulb tray and they all stack up. So you can get a lot of flats in the back of your truck or your trailer if you own and use black bulb trays. So there's a lot of really great ways to get plants around, even though um, you have to kind of, we had to be creative when we first thought about it. You said you've got um, 
a hundred acres of vegetables. We have a hundred acre farm. Okay. And it's not all wall to wall and vegetables because, you know, we like to have a little diversity. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a waterway and we have some wetlands and we had this year about 32 acres um, of actual crop field cultivated with another 15 acres of headlands, permanent, um, permanent harvest lanes. Um, and then the remainder of that hundred acres was actually cover cropped. And because we've just transitioned this farm to certified organic, um, it's, it wasn't all immediately, um, put to vegetables. So we'll be developing more and more land as we go. This coming year, we'll be at about 40 acres. Um, probably we would top off of cultivated vegetables, not counting the um, headlands and, and harvest lanes at about 55 acres. Okay. And so that makes, that makes something like the transplant production a really valuable way for you to be able to diversify and expand your business without having to invest in more farmland. Yeah, it really does. Um, this year it was, um, uh, things coming out of our greenhouse was, um, more than a third of our total income. So, and we certainly haven't developed the, the greenhouses completely either. Um, when we bought the property, the greenhouses were, um, used almost exclusively for, um, petunia production for big box stores. So, you know, like literally two acres of bright pink petunias um, were grown in these greenhouses and all the greenhouses, rather than having benches, had uh, just sand beds covered with um, ground fabric. So we've transitioned many of those to be in, in ground production, but they have to go through a three year transition as well. So um, most of the bays in our greenhouses actually are not certified organic in ground production yet. We're still in the process. Um, so we're not, okay. not fully in, you know, even though we've moved in two years ago, we're not fully installed. It feels like it's, it's definitely a process. It'll be um, going on for another couple of years. So just to, just to put that in context for, for our listeners, and I, sometimes I forget, I know all about what has gone on. Well, I don't know all about, but I know a lot about <laughs> what's gone on at Gardens of Egan over the last number of years. But you, the, the Wedge purchased Gardens of Egan from Martin and Atina Diffley in, was it 2008? Yeah, but they just bought the business. They did not buy the farm. I know often we think of the name of a farm as being attached to the physical real estate, but, you know, it's a business. It was an LLC, and the Wedge bought the business, um, the brand name, the logo, and really some of the blue sky that went along with it, um, the customer list, and um, just kind of doing introductions. Um, the Diffleys, the farmers, introduced us to their customers and kind of, you know, gave their customers the sense that we had their their approval. We had the farmer approval. Yeah. And the Diffley farm had been, I mean, Gardens of Egan is a, I mean, it's, it's really a legacy brand in the, in the Twin Cities natural foods market. Absolutely. They're probably, probably the earliest organic pioneer selling to the Twin Cities that still, that was still located and active marketing into the Twin Cities, you know, so they stay their established date was 1974, I believe, oh, or wow. 1973. I mean, I think I was still in high school. <laughs> I think I, I think I was uh, I think I was still in preschool. And uh, uh, the uh, so 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 they bought the farm in the wedge. Bought the farm in 2000. Eight. eight from from the Diffleys and that farm was in Farmington, which is a few miles north from where you are now. Mm -hmm. And and you guys operated there for a number of years and then decided that that it made sense to invest in some new farmland. Yeah, you know, I call what we did at the Diffley farm uh test drive. Um because, you know, a food co-op is not necessarily they don't really necessarily know why or what they're doing when they get into a farm. They just know that it was a good idea. Um, they were actually, they were actually approached by the farmers who wanted to retire and make a change in their lifestyle. And um, they were approached by the farmers to, you know, 
potentially buy this farm, not just the business, but also the real estate. And so um, for five years, the wedge operated the real estate that the Diffleys had farmed um, under a rental agreement. But when that agreement, which was for five years, came came up, the decision was, well, you can either buy part of the Diffley farm or you can stop farming or you can buy a different farm. And when we put pencil to paper, we decided that the wedge did want to continue to farm. It felt like it was a val valuable way to um, use its resources. And it also decided that it needed to look for a different piece of property. Remember I said we didn't have any greenhouse space? Right. Well, there were other things that we wouldn't have had had we stayed at the Diffley property. We would have had to make some capital investments there, even if um, we wanted to stay at that farm. So we decided to make those capital investments on a new piece of property that was not certified organic at the time, but it did have 12 bays of greenhouse space and a lot of really um, high quality land, even though it was being farmed conventionally. Okay. So you guys have just finished making the, the transition to, to get all that land so that it's certified organic now. Yes. In mid 2014, August 1st, um, the farmland became organic. All right. That's very cool. You know, <laughs> at the time when we went down that road, I would have said, well, that's a big accomplishment. But now that we've actually taken ourselves through that 36 month process, um, I feel like it's a much bigger accomplishment than, than I understood when I started. Um, it is a, you know, if it's a financial investment, without a doubt, because um, you're really, you know, taking on farmland that you're going to build the soil and you have to do that. And the first year that we were building the soil, we were not farming at all. We didn't take any income off of this property. So um, no income the first year and only about 15 acres of income the second year and the third year, 30 acres of income. And you've got all the taxes and, you know, all your mortgage. And it's really a big financial investment that you're making. Um, on the other hand, it was very exciting to you know, like really have this blank slate to work with. And um, I'm really proud of the farm that we've created. So it's it definitely is something I would do again, but it's no small venture. What do you think were the keys to making that successful organic transition? I mean, you guys, I mean, clearly having a supportive market was, was an important element of that. But from a from a farming perspective, what, what did you do to get that land uh, through the transition to go from being Roundup ready corn and soybeans to being, uh -huh. uh, to being organic ready vegetable land? Well, um, I probably won't do a very good job of saying everything we've done, but some of the things that I think we did right and are highlights and that may translate to other people's farms, um, if they're thinking about doing a transition is we worked with NRCS and we signed a contract for cover cropping. And that was a really big financial help for the first year because we were able to get get in the um, conservation program with NRCS and they helped defray some of the costs of um, planting and buying seed for a cover, you know, a hundred acres of cover crop. That's a lot of cover crop. Yeah, that's nothing to sneeze at. I remember looking at the bills for like 10 acres of cover crops and going, oh my God, what have I got myself into? Right, yeah. right. Now, so but, and was that with the EQIP program? Well, EQIP is more, as I understand it, for equipment. And this is a CSP program, I believe. I'm not sure the exact name, but it's... Um, it's the program that pays for farmers to put in pollinator habitat and cover crop and um, address any waterway issues they have on their farm. Um, it's that program. And I don't know that I'm saying the right letters or not. C well, we'll, S P. We'll get the we'll get the right letters and make sure we get those in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I think now there's the new farm bill. So I don't know what they've done to that program, but I understand that it does still exist in some form. And that was really helpful. And, you know, another thing we did was really, um, you know, you have the most recent experience of the farm you're farming. What is it about that farm that's not working very well? And can you fix that when you get to your new farm? And one of the things that we did on the new farm that I think um, 
it's been very, very helpful for planning purposes and for understanding um, uh, profitability and yields is we created as uniform a po as possible um, planting sections. So most of our farm is divided up into third acre sections um, and they're, they're designed for a width that works with um, a very, it's not really a machine, it's more like a conveyor belt. Um, we, we use a vegveyor to harvest many of our crops and that vegveyor reaches out over half of that section, that third acre section, um, four beds or eight beds depending on the width of the beds. And then when it turns around and goes up the other way, it reaches over the other half of the field. And so we're, it's just so um, unbelievably convenient. Um, to use that um, vegetable conveyor belt harvest system now that all of our sections are the same width. And when we do the math to figure out, you know, how many acres of this or that we want, um, each section has 16 beds. And it's just, um, it's very uniform. It's super easy. And of course, many farms don't lend themselves to that because they have some historical um, divisions or hedgerows or waterways but the parts of the farm that we could do this with we did it with and it was um i have to say a really great idea if you do say so yourself right well it wasn't me i have to say john middleton who worked for us um during this entire transition he really led the transition and um he was the one that instituted that and i was really really pleased and he also instituted um permanent harvest lanes between all of these sections. Now, if you're strapped for land, you're not gonna be able to do that, but we weren't strapped for land. And eventually we could take those permanent harvest lanes and put them into production if we really need to. But at least right now, um, while we have plenty of acres, um, more acres than we need to farm intensively, those permanent harvest lanes are a way to always have something blooming because they are seeded down to um, blooming, um, blooming clovers and also um it's a way to always when we're driving through the field for harvest no matter the um, conditions of the soil whether it's muddy or dry um, we're really protecting that soil much better than we would be if um, we were driving through the field um, to harvest things so we just feel like that was another really good thing that we could do because we had a blank slate to work with and finally another very important um guiding star during our transition was extensive soil testing and we work with um you know a lab and an advisor that we really trust and when we looked at what our soils needed um, we were just prepared to make those amendments because really you know what is your farm if it's not good soil and we some of the parts of our farm have a ways to go yet other parts were you know already um really good soil type so we have a lot of good things to work with but we did amend the soil heavily so uh, can i ask who you worked with for the soil testing and the and the soil consulting yeah we worked with midwestern bioag okay um out of uh blue mounds wisconsin that's good to know. I mean, I, I know um, we we really struggled with soils on my farm and never, never really felt like we got it right. And uh, I think that that having like you said, it's it's the foundation, you know, and it was in and, uh, you know, when you think about those the whole idea of, of a, of a barrel and, and the shortest stave, you can't fill things up beyond the shortest stave in the barrel. Uh, right. You know, right. this is, this is the, this is the old thing they talked about with, uh, with, with macronutrients uh, in the, and, and micronutrients in my, in my soils class was, was this concept. And, but we just didn't, we, the soil really was the, the stave in the barrel in my farm that we never really, we never mm -hmm. really got built up high enough and it kind of held everything else back. So I think that's a really important element. Uh, make sure you get that right well you know um one of the things that i want to emphasize is that don't just rely on your soil consultant 
because you really can understand those soil tests with a little bit of time. In fact, you can Google everything, folks. But I really think every farmer has the responsibility to become reasonably proficient in what those tests mean and, um, you know, look at them and compare them year to year. So you can have a soil consultant, and I think that's a great thing. But don't just, you know, turn over that responsibility, which is the number one responsibility you have as an organic farmer. Don't just turn it over to them to make recommendations. Um, you know, some soil consultants really recommend based on what they want to sell you more than what your soil needs because there are lots of options. We use our soil consultant in the lab as, you know, a second or third brain behind what we're going to do on our farm. They're not the ones that look at the test and say, this is what you need and then that's what we do. But they are able to um, blend some fertilizers so that we could get things um, tuned to our field and our needs rather than just buying something off the shelf um, that maybe wasn't exactly right for what we needed. So that was a really helpful thing to have some blended custom blends for our farm. Linda, I'm going to break in here for a quick word from our sponsors. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Second Cup Media, a website design and marketing firm run by Christy Waits and Thomas Ponick. They've worked in the technology field for nearly 20 years and love sharing their knowledge and expertise with tiny business owners, including farmers. Their business operates on two fundamental principles, simple plus personal. A key part to building a tiny business in today's world is knowing how to cultivate a strong and lasting relationship with customers and understanding the value of a good conversation. Building a tiny business isn't all about balance sheets and bookkeeping. It's about keeping people engaged long enough for that second cup. The world is changing. The economy is changing. Businesses are changing. But most importantly, people are changing. Bigger, better, faster is no longer sustainable. But tiny is. Tiny businesses are built on a solid foundation of slow growth, strong relationships, and manageable tasks. And Second Cup Media can help www.secondcupmedia.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by Purple Pitchfork, where Chris Blanchard, that's me, provides consulting, coaching, and information resources to farmers, food businesses, and the organizations that support them. I draw on over 25 years in the organic farming business to provide down-to-earth solutions to beginning and experienced farmers from around North America. Whether you're just getting started in farming or have been doing it for most of your life, it's worth keeping in mind that even seasoned professionals can use an outside perspective to bring out their best performance. I've assisted farmers with employee management, business planning, food safety assessments, and packing house design, as well as marketing strategies. With experience on farms from one half to 100 acres i bring the knowledge and approaches that you need to improve your farm your business and your life i don't specialize in silver bullet solutions and i don't promise that you'll always like what you hear but i do have a record of creating real results on real farms www.purplepitchfork.com so you mentioned that um that john middleton was in a really led the idea of getting your permanent field roads installed uh, Mm -hmm. during this transition. And Linda, and you and I've known each other for a long time. Um, This is something that I think is that you've got a really good handle on that I'd really like to dig into is, is how you work with your crew. I mean, obviously to, to, to have, I mean, you, you said flat out, it, was, it wasn't my idea. That was somebody else's idea. But but you've got uh, acres and acres invested into this. You've got money put into having the permanent soil roads uh, seeded down with the, with the cover crops, with the clovers that you've got in there. Uh, how how do you how did you find and attract somebody who had the kind of smarts and experience to really be able to look at the situation and come up with not just a better way to pick the kale, but really a, a farm wide system of management for this, for this one piece of the operation. Hmm. Well, I think what you're asking me is um, how come I don't want to do everything myself? <laughs> you know, I, I think a lot of farmers really do want to keep control of everything because they're the ones at risk, right? And often they know the best way to do something. And so it's hard to turn something over to someone else. Um, 
So are you trying to ferret out why I um, let John have have a big reign there or well, why? And, and I guess why and how? I mean, I yeah. always I always think it's. You read a lot, um, and I've and I've encountered a lot of of situations with my clients and with with farms that I know where they have somebody who's got the kinds of smarts that you said that John came in with, but then they they just completely they end up abrogating their responsibilities rather than rather than uh, shepherding somebody through them, and yeah. and and I think. You know, I, I worked for you back in 1993 and <laughs> and um, which which makes me feel a little old and probably makes you feel even older. Um, I didn't have any gray hair back then. I know that the uh, <laughs> but, but even back then there was, uh, you know, an appropriate amount of rain that I was able to operate with. But I didn't have all the rain that I thought that I should have. And of course, I was. I mean, 1993, I was uh, 23, 24 years old and, and of course thought I should have all the rain in the world. Um, but you, you finesse that line. And if you've got somebody on your farm, who's playing an important role, and you mentioned this with the greenhouse manager, you said you've got a greenhouse manager. And then you said that that, uh, the work that he did, the, the area that he's responsible for managing was a third of your gross receipts for the year. I mean, clearly your you're giving over large portions of responsibility to other people on your farm, but you're, Mm -hmm. but I also know because of the results that you're getting with people who don't have the depth of experience that you bring or the breadth of experience that you bring to gardens of Egan. I don't think you're just uh, turning stuff over and walking away. You're, you're guiding them through the process, but letting them, I don't know, letting them have enough rain, but not letting them have too much. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I think it's really important when I, when I took over gardens of Egan, um, somehow I felt obligated to come up with some mission or, or something to put on our website because the wedge, you know, they're a retail store. They have a great website and, um, and it was suggested that we should have a great website now. And it was 2008. Everyone finally thought they needed a website, I guess. And, and I just decided that um, it was my opportunity to, you know, speak the way I wanted to speak. And I just decided that the important thing I wanted to say on our website was um, dirt first and a farm is its people. And it didn't really resonate with anybody except me. A farm is its people. What, you know, that's just like kind of where did she get that? But I think that um, now, after eight years, seven seven seasons, I think um, I feel really proud that I've kind of been able to put that into action because we really do have some great people. First of all, you have to attract good people and then you have to recognize what it is they're good at and really um, let them run with it and trust them. For heaven's sakes, you've got to trust them. And, you know, if trust doesn't come easily because... Um, you know, you had a really bad year and your banker's breathing down your throat and you just don't think you can afford to trust them. I say you can't afford not to trust them because you really can't do everything on your farm, not a hundred acre farm. You can't do it all. And so you have to bring out the best in whoever you have. And the way to do that is to trust them. And I check in with them often and there's a lot of reminders and maybe I seem, um, um, you know, I think my style and people kind of uh, joke about it at the farm. Uh, I make a lot of lists, uh, to-do lists, and they're mostly for other people. But then I let them do it the way they feel like it needs to be done. And I think if something's on the list and I trust Mike or John or Molly and they're going to do it, then they do it and they get it done and they're invested in it because they weren't able to really do it their way. Now, obviously, if you have people you don't trust, you need to move them on, (laughs) show them the door and let them find their their way to a new farm where maybe they'll be an asset. But there's got to be, I'm sure that you have a way, uh, well, a limit to what you're trusting people with. You talk about people doing things their way. They've still got to produce the results that you need them to produce. It's, It's not like 
they can decide that they're going to uh, harvest small heads of broccoli instead of big heads of broccoli because that's the creative mood that they're in today. Well, right. And I guess it, it's important for me to say that people have to earn their earn the trust that they've been given. Um, they really do have to earn it. But, you know, some things, a few things really turn out wrong and it's everyone's learning lesson. And sometimes I kick myself because I say, well, I could have pre- prevented that had I been involved in that decision. But um, if you do it more right than you do it wrong, I think, I think you're, you come out a winner. You know, it's not like I do everything right. And it's not like everyone who works on the farm every year leaves at the end of the season and says, wow, we just think Linda's the greatest, you know, no farmer is the greatest all the time. Um, we make mistakes and um, sometimes turn people off because you have to tell it the way it is sometimes and force people to, um, you know, take responsibility and shoulder a load. But I don't know. I think, honestly, it, it comes from um, an early lesson in learning to respect people because And I want to tell a little story about the time I really learned the great respect I had for fellow harvesters. When when I was really just an employee on a farm, um, I was working alongside people who had been only on the harvest crew and probably were only ever going to be on the harvest crew. They were limited English speaking immigrants. And um, I just learned that they, in many, many ways, knew more about uh, the pests and the condition of the crop than the farmer that we were working for. Um, And it was, it was really, um, I don't know what the word is for it, but it made me realize that no matter what responsibility they may have, um, they may actually be bringing a lot of information to the table when they uh, bring up the point that there's aphids in this field or they saw something in another field or these things are just not ready to harvest. Um, I don't know. I just, I learned that you really do need to listen to every single person on the crew um, and find out what their, what their story is. Well, and I remember learning how to harvest from a a group of a a crew of limited English speaking immigrants and, um, you know, really feeling like a complete butterfingers and realizing just how slow I was as a as a young farmer when I worked with people who had been doing this for years, who kind of who had been doing it for long enough that it was part of them instead of just something that they were doing and and how, how important some of those the skill development was, I mean, I remember trying to ask, um, asking one woman on the crew and saying, well, you know, show me how you pick the spinach. And she's like, I don't know how I pick the spinach. I just pick the spinach, you know, right. and I'm three times as fast as you now go faster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and trying to figure out what it was, uh, that, that they were doing. It really was a lesson in, in humility. And, and like you said, they, I think, um, I think that sometimes it's, it's easy because we have, well, we're, you know, I'm the farm owner or I'm the packing shed manager that I somehow have all of the answers. Uh, and, and that a lot of times, especially when you're working with limited English speakers, they, they, uh, they bring things to the table that aren't necessarily readily communicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. whether, whether they have the ability to say there's aphids in that field or not, um, can make a, can make a big difference in how you access their information and skills and, and powers of observation that they bring. Um, yeah. Well, I think that is really, um, it was really my first year, um, working on a, a farm of, you know, a production size farm and, um, she's true lore. She's, a, um, a very wise and really amazingly old Hmong woman who was working alongside me, outworking me. And she's really, she's my hero. And she was my mentor the whole time um, I worked at Harmony Valley. So yeah, she was really um, an important teacher for me. And, you know, no one, you know, that farm, Harmony Valley, I think has um, gained a lot of respect over its, you know, 30 years of existence. And I would say that, 99% 99% of people who walked on that farm um, never met True Lore or knew how instrumental she was in a lot of things that happened there. 
you know, just because she was on the harvest crew and that was it. And I just learned that you need to um, really respect what people bring to the table, no matter what their role is. So you mentioned our history at, our, at, at Harmony Valley and you were certainly there uh, at an entirely different level and for a lot longer than I was. Um, it, it was for a number of years, the place that I kept coming back to when I should have been someplace else. It was every time, every, <laughs> every time I got in a little bit of trouble, I was back at Harmony Valley. You guys were bailing me out, but, but the only uh, bailing you out in that you came to work for us. Yes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but bailing me out in the sense that you gave me a place to go and work. Uh, but I always, I mean, I, I always remember uh, when I, when I accepted my job there in 1993 uh, and I was very excited about it. And I went back to my, my local food co-op in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it was actually at the Mifflin street co-op there. And I, <laughs> and I remember talking to uh, the woman who was running the cash register, who I'd kind of gotten to know over a year of living there. And I, I was really pumped. I'm like, I got a job at Harmony Valley farm. I'm going to be working there this summer. And she said, Oh, you don't want to work for them. They're ogres. And she told me this story about having these people come and basically say that, that, um, that, that you as, as half of the management team there were, and were a horrible place to work and <laughs> horrible managers to work for. And that certainly, I mean, it wasn't, obviously it wasn't my experience. I kept coming back for more. Um, but, but you obviously, had at some point in your history, that element of, of not, I don't, you know, not being a great manager, not getting the results that you needed out of people. So what, what have you learned over the years? And sorry, see now here, I'm telling you, I'm telling your story for you, but what have you, what, what have you learned over the years about managing employees? Because I don't think that you could find somebody. And I, I know a lot of the crew members at gardens of Egan, um, I don't think you could find somebody who would walk away from Gardens of Egan now and say, God, Linda's just uh she's an ogre. <laughs> no, um, I remember exactly who those people were. In fact, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to bring that up, but you know, I know it is uh, really true that, um, I think we made a, a big effort to learn from our mistakes and not everyone walks into a farm imagining that they're going to be a great people manager. Most people who start farming are not dreaming about the hours that they spend um, training, engaging with, or um, discussing improvements that need to be made with the employees on their farm. You know, that's just not what you dream about when you, when you think about running a farm. But it is really necessary thing once you get to a certain scale. And um, I think we worked very hard on um, some, you know, employee management skills, but you really also just have to bring to the table um, a willingness to see people as, um, you know, valuable and you really have to respect people. So would I have done something different that first year if I'd been the person I am now? Absolutely. I mean, people are not there because it's, uh, they're not into it like you are when it's your farm. You're all about it. It's your farm. You do anything for it. And you know, that's not the people who work for you on an hourly basis during uh, a season, their life is not that farm and you really can't expect them to be. So you kind of have to let, um, you kind of have to let yourself say, okay, they're only going to give me eight great hours a day and I can't expect them to work the, the next two and be really happy over time. I, I do think that there's a limit to um, how much we can expect. And that limit I think has um, been adjusted down a little bit now in the past um, eight years. It depends on what kind of farm crew you work with. Um, but Nevertheless, I think, um, yeah, I would have done it differently those first few years in the beginning. How long do you feel like it took you to become good at managing people? Mm, a, a couple of years, but it was really with trying to be very intentional about improving. Um, you know, in the thick of the season, when you're really, really focused on getting your work done, um, 
it's really easy to not, to, really easy to blame the employees just not listening or they're just not trying or they're just slackers or um, they're just not careful with your equipment um, when often lots of it, lots of times it's something that um, the employer could do, the farmer could do to make things better. But it's really hard to look at yourself um, when you're, you're working 24 seven, really, really hard. Um, you don't have those extra few minutes of luxury left to be reflective, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, well, not just the extra few minutes, but just, I mean, even the extra few neurons, uh, <laughs> you know, it's all taken up. Uh, yeah. It's easy to lose that capacity. So yes. Uh, what other, I mean, you, you, you talk about, uh, I, I, in some ways lowering your expectations for not necessarily the quality of what people are going to put in, but the quantity of what people are going to put in. What else have you found when you talk about being intentional about about changing the way you manage people, what what other kinds of intention did you apply? Um, you know, I learned this from other farmers. You, you other farmers are the wealth of information, and maybe that's why you're doing this podcast. That's why you're here, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember um, distinctly, I, I was in a, a research group um, conducted by. Um, the University of Wisconsin, and uh, we were all CSA farmers, and we had to keep track of how many hours we were spending on on work versus our personal life, and really what what personal life. You know, my line, my my life was just pretty much work, and the personal life was just blurred right into it. And um, uh, when we shared how many hours we worked a week, I had some sense of pride that you know, at Harmony Valley, our hours were the highest. And I was working, I was at a table with another farmer that I really respect, Steve Pincus. And his farmer, his hours were not nearly as high. And he seemed like a really happy guy with a really great farm. <laughs> like, you know what? You can uh, have, a, have a great farm and be happy and not work 24-7. And, and I, so that's something I learned. And he also said that, you know, his employees went home after eight hours and I just was kind of thinking, well, you can't coddle people like that. And that was when the revelation was, if people give you eight great hours and they're still smiling at the end of the day and they go home and they want to come back and at the end of the season, they want to come back the next season, that's much better than people being, you know, like really dragging at the end of a 10 hour day because I'm going to work 10 hours. Does that really mean that all my employees need to work 10 hours? No, it really doesn't. And it doesn't mean you're less of a farmer. It doesn't mean you're less of a farm at all. Um, I think you're, you're more of a farmer. If you can keep people engaged positively, being productive, learning while they're there, and then wanting to come back the next year. I mean, what's better than that? All, all of those minutes you spend retraining new people, training new people, wouldn't it be great if you could just uh, take a few minutes to appreciate the people you have this year so that they want to come back next year? Well, and especially when you think about the importance of, of leadership and, and of, of really of, of what I think of as peer leadership, you know, having somebody else on the crew who can say to the other members of the crew, Hey, this is how we get this job done. This is, this is the fastest way to do it. This is the pace that we can expect that you're going to be able to meet because I can do it too. Cause when you've been farming for 20 years or 10 years, even, you know, I, I know we used to. I used to run into this where, where my employees look at me and go, well, you're, you're Chris Blanchard. You've been doing this forever. Of course you can pick 60, 80 bunches of kale an hour. I'm never going to be able to do that. And, and if they didn't have somebody else to compare to who could also say, yeah, you know, I've only been doing this for a year, but look, I can do, I can do 50 to 70 bunches an hour of kale. Then, mm -hmm. then it was, it was almost like it was too much for them to reach to. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that peer leadership and it, and it takes so much weight off of your shoulders to be able to do that. You know, yes, to, that's to, true. to be able to say, Hey, John, let's, you know, can you, can you make sure that the cabbage harvest is going the way that the cabbage harvest needs to go rather than, rather than Linda having to be there every minute of every day. That's yeah. really true. Um, and we, you know, at gardens of Egan now, I feel like we have something that maybe not, and I don't know. 
I, as a farm manager, it's a little different than a farm owner. There's more room at the table. Um, so I have a management team and I'm the farm manager, but um, we have the greenhouse manager and we have the production manager and, and we have the packing shed manager. Um, and they all really contribute a lot to what happens at the farm and um, really have a lot of um, leeway over how they run their part of the farm. And um, it just, it kind of shoulders the load in a much happier way, but also, uh, you know, not one of us has the wisdom of all of us together. And I really feel like it's um, created a really strong team. And it has allowed me to give people jobs um, year after year. They keep coming back. And that is, that consistency is super important in um, keeping the systems going on the farm. Um, I really like to say that we use systems, but systems aren't any good if you have to reinvent them every year. And, um, you know, having people come back over and over. In fact, a couple of them have year round jobs, so it's not like they're even coming back. They, they don't leave, but um, they're able to really pass on um, the systems and train for the people who come back seasonally. It's just like invaluable. We're not reinventing the wheel. We can be such a better farm because we know what we're doing. We don't have to think that hard about it. It just happens because it's the way we've done it and it works. But the converse must also be true. It's, it's interesting that you say we don't have to think that hard about about it. But if you have a management team that's really working together, it means that you're you've got to be taking some time with your team when they're when Susan's not washing bunches in the packing shed, <laughs> when when Mike's not out on the tractor to say um, to say, OK, we're sitting down and we're talking about what we're getting done this week or, you know, what needs to be, what needs to be different next week or, or what have you. I mean, you, you, do you have a regular structure that you follow in that regard? Yeah, we do. And when I say we don't have to think that hard about it, I don't mean that we're not thinking about it. It means that when you're really in the thick of the season, if you have to think, how are we going to pick kale today? It's too late. You just have to have your system for picking kale and everyone knows what they get uh, when they get the supplies ready to get in the truck and get to the field. And it just happens because it's very routine and it's very well thought out, but you're not thinking it out that day. So yeah, we do. We have um, a regular meeting and sometimes we hate having meetings, but we do need to talk to each other. <laughs> um, so we have a regular meeting every day for about 30 minutes, the uh, management team. And then um, Molly, who runs the harvest crew, and sometimes Mike, who joins her, and sometimes Susan, who may join her, depending on what day of the week it is. Then there's another, like, maybe 15 minutes um, with the whole harvest crew in front of the whiteboard where the day is laid out and the immediate jobs are laid out. And then they do that again for about 15 minutes after lunch when the whole group gathers again. So we do definitely have regularly structured meetings. Um, and they're not long and they don't drag on, but it is really important to communicate if you have, um, you know, a team of people making decisions. If all the decisions are made in one person's head, you don't have to talk quite as much. Yeah. Which would be kind of a farmer thing, right? Just that to not, would be a to farmer not have thing. to talk that much. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so when you've got somebody on your farm who's really figuring out something new, uh, and I'm and I'm thinking here in particular of your transplant production, mm-hmm. and of of having a having doing transplants for farmers. You know what you were talking about the cardboard boxes and the, um, I mean obviously doing more and marketing that stuff. How are you delegating those kinds of responsibilities? Because I think it's it's something that um, I mean even even on a on a relatively small scale farm, you know, you're, when you're trying to innovate something new, I mean, there's already enough going on, but you're always trying to find a new angle and a different angle. How do you, how do you let go enough, but not too much in when you say to somebody, um, you know, let's figure out this transplant production thing. Mm. Well, some of the things I do myself, like figuring out those cartons, (laughs) um, just because I've had the most experience probably in researching new ways to do things. Um, so I took that on myself, 
But um, as we brought in the guy who, you know, designed the box for us, I brought Susan in because she grows a lot of transplants and she was going to be the one packing them up with me. So I just always, even if it's something that I may spearhead, I bring people in before it's all done so people can participate and, you know, lend their wisdom to it. And that's how other people work um, with it as well. Like Mike this year was heading up um, the research for our irrigation system. And, you know, he was the contact person. He did a lot of research, but before all was said and done, you know, he brought me in and he touched base with me frequently when you know, there were um, decisions to be made about who we were going to go, who we were going to work with and any number of decisions along the way. So I think it's um, now I feel like we have achieved the balance where people can go out um get some information, get some things done on their own, maybe think about a new way to do things. And then the balance is coming back and touching base with people and bringing people in so that you haven't just created something in a vacuum without other people's buy-in and also other people's wisdom. Um, I guess it's probably not so different than people management in a manufacturing plant or any kind of small business. Um, I don't really know because I guess I didn't work in those, but I just would imagine that there are a lot of um, a lot of similarities to just working with people and working on teams. Yeah, which again does it isn't really why most of us got into this business, you know. So it is. I think it's it becomes an interesting challenge because to to be to be in the business, you have to do these other things that aren't necessarily why you wanted to be in business. It's almost like paying your taxes or, you know, you've, that's, that's the price you pay to play the game. You know? Well, and there are some really good farmers who are really bad at managing people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very unfortunate because, um, you know, they're good farmers and their business may not succeed if they don't find um, someone that they can trust who can then help them manage people. You know, we're not good at everything. And so whether you find a business partner or whether you find an employee and give them some um, management responsibilities, find someone who's a compliment to what you do because you can't you can't do all and be everything. You know, John did so much better um, in designing the way we're going to lay out our new farm than I would have done. Um, so it was good to have him there. You know, it's really interesting, but I think that um, maybe it's because I have moved around the country and maybe it's because of, uh, because I like to attract people who bring a lot. I think, um, there's some model farms out there that have had a big influence on the way other farms um, develop. Yes. And I, I think, you know, John worked at Roxbury Farm for a while, and I think he brought so much of what he learned there. And, um, you know, I'm from Harmony Valley Farm, and certainly I bring so much of what um, those 15 years in Harmony Valley were and what I learned. A lot of it was about managing people there, too. Um, but also production things and marketing things. And, um, you know, I, I just think that there are certain key farms around the country that have had a big um, style influence. And I know that when I um, farmed in Wisconsin and marketed in Madison, there was a restaurant that performed this same similar service. Um, they, Le Toile restaurant was owned and run by Odessa Piper at the time. And her kitchen spawned so many offshoots, so many spinoffs of um, what she was doing and what, what she was trying to attain. People took what they learned in her restaurant and her kitchen and, um, you know, took it in and they did it their own way. But all around the city, like she had seated all these great chefs and restaurateurs around Madison. And so that's what happens with a lot of um, really good productive farms. Um, around the country. Those ideas get seeded through people who work on those farms and move off and either start their own farm or go to other farms to work. And um, I guess it's a farmer to farmer kind of thing, but I don't know. 
Did that make any sense? That totally. That, I- that totally makes sense. And I, I mean, I know that the, we had people came, came to our farm and, and would look and see that we, you know, see what we were doing and, and felt like somehow, uh, somehow I was getting it right. You know, and uh-huh. and and I always kind of laughed because I never had one original idea on my farm. You know, almost that's, that's well, that's not quite true. I had one original idea, but but most ninety nine percent of what I did, um, I mean, we we actually used to laugh uh, and say, you know, how do I know? Well, because Harmony Valley told me so. You know, <laughs> that, that it was it 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 really is, and I think I think it's a. I think it's something that is actually missing in a lot of, of employee management situations is, is not, not really knowing what success looks like, not having a vision of what, what a farm can be. Uh, Uh I think it'd be really, can be really dangerous. Um, I was talking to, I was talking to another grower recently who, who commented about, um, about people not being able to control weeds on their farm and not knowing what, clean fields looked like because they had never seen them. And, right. and so thinking that if you grow organic vegetables, you're supposed to be picking the beans out of the weeds uh, instead of seeing that as a failure. Now I picked a lot of beans out of a lot of weeds on my farm. Uh, and I put a lot of employees through a lot of picking beans out of weeds on my farm. And to all you employees, I'm really sorry about that. But, <laughs> but to me, it was a, the advantage that I felt like I had is that I knew that it wasn't supposed to be like that. You know, uh-huh. I, I had a vision of what success could look like. And I think that's, I think it is something that's really important. Um, when you, when you talk about farmer to farmer and you talk about farms kind of spawning other successes, it uh-huh. is, I think, because, because you're giving people a vision of what, what does success actually look like? And, and I think it probably has something to do with you being able to successfully engage employees at a high level is that fundamentally when things fundamentally work, it's easier to make things work. Right. That's um, right. You know, it's, it's, uh, the, the, e- and what's a, you know, it's a, it's a horrible trap actually when things are going wrong because the easier things are, the easier they get. And the converse is also true. The harder things are, the harder they get. And if, mm-hmm. if, you know, if you have a farm where tractors don't start equipment breaks, the fields are full of weeds, um, the soil isn't well drained and, and you don't have what you need to pack your vegetables. It's going to be really hard to get employees to come and, and engage at a very high, very productive level and, and to be able to suss out that creativity from them to put into the problem solving, to be able to figure out the irrigation system and know when they need to check back about the irrigation system and feel like when they check back with you, Linda, that, that, that you've got enough of a handle on how things are that you're going to have something to contribute to that. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. I really think that, um, it really shows when someone has spent, um, some years working on, a really successful farm. Um, they bring those expectations for success and whatever the systems were that worked, (laughs) just like you say, if the tractors start in the morning, then that's the expectation. And if you've worked somewhere where the tractors just never start, then maybe you don't know that that can be an expectation. So, um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Well, my hope for your podcast is that you are able to tap into some of those farms that really serve as models in their regions um, and are bringing some kind of systems of success that get seeded around their region um, through the people who move through their farm because we all have people who move through our farm because this is a business that's necessarily labor intensive. It's definitely, we've got human capital to spend um, as we, you know, create, create a sustainable food system where there will be more new farmers coming on and hopefully they've been able to spend time on really good farms and learn some lessons and take that with them. Well, gosh, Linda, I couldn't have done a better conclusion um, myself. So nice, <laughs> nicely done. Um, thank you very much, Linda. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to hear about uh, about Gardens of Vegan and about your history farming and to talk with you about about this whole big issue of 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 engaging your employees and getting the most out of them. So thank well, you, you know, very I, much. You're very welcome. Um, thank you for ha- having invited me.
So listeners, if you don't already know, you can find links to the things we've mentioned in today's episode by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com and searching for Holly. That's H A L L E Y. So farmer to farmer podcast.com search for Holly. And again, thank you so much for joining us today for the farmer to farmer podcast. I feel so lucky to get, have all the listeners that we've had and the great growth that we've seen in this show just over the few short weeks that we've been doing it. Again, you can find links from the show and more notes at the farmer to farmer podcast.com. Just search for Hallie. That's H-A-L-L-E-Y. You can subscribe to this show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice to get new episodes as soon as they're released. You know, you've always got them whenever you need them. And please take the time to leave a rating or a review. It really does make a difference in how many people this show can reach. You can find us on Facebook at Purple Pitchfork, and you can sign up for my newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga, at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or on my website, purplepitchfork.com. Thank you again. Have a great week and keep the tractor running.